Are you playing the intro now? And a good evening to you all. How the hell are we doing on this wonderful, wonderful Saturday? And we are greeted with a guest on stream. Some of you will know him as the voice of Three Dog. Some will know him as Nazir or even Champion Nasus. But we know him in the Swoto community as Prince Turned Emperor Arkan. We are greeted on stream today. By Eric Dellums. Eric, how the hell are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, as Three Dog would say. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to thank you, of course, for your time. I know you said on um, prior to the stream that you've you've got probably around about an hour, maybe an hour and a half of, of time available. And we, we greatly appreciate that. Thank you for for spending that time with us today. Um, well, thank you for having me. So. How are you? How are you holding up during lockdown at the moment? Then <laughs> I feel like I spend my entire life either staring at a video screen on Zoom or putting on a mask, but I'm holding up. Yeah, yeah. I think we're just about we're just about coping and surviving at the moment. So, yeah. I think it would it would probably be quite appropriate to start at the, at the very beginning. Um, okay. So. I understand, of course, that your family's, you've got quite a big family, you've got quite a number of siblings, and uh, they've all got quite varied, varied careers. I know that your your parents had worked in, in law, and your uh, late father worked in, in politics as well. Um, yeah. Your sister Piper, she's an author as well. So what on earth made you decide to go into the voice acting industry? It's, it's quite a big difference in career compared to the, the family ethics there. Yeah, I, well, you know, uh, my siblings and I were always in uh, children's theater, and uh, so I, I actually was bitten by the acting bug very early. I, I fell in love with acting. I actually stumbled upon the voiceover career um, through, um, well, two, two things. One, being an actor, and in college, I was actually a disc jockey, speaking of uh, three dogs. Yeah. And uh, a woman that I went to college with remembered that um, remembered me doing uh, DJing for the years that we were there, and she actually got me my first voiceover job, which was for uh, Discovery Networks. And then I got more voice work at Travel Channel, and then Science Channel, and and then uh, Aaron Ehas, who created. Uh, uh, was one of the creators of Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, contacted me out of clear blue and asked me if I was interested in doing some voice work. And I told him, sure. And so he had written this character, Ko, for The Last Airbender, and I did that, and that was actually my first voiceover acting game. So. And when you look at Avatar The Last Airbender, it was actually quite a successful TV series as well. It was actually quite 
quite prominent within the anime industry and it, it grew and and a lot of the fan base actually really enjoyed it as well. Oh, it was huge. It's a, my, I, I, my dog actually just walked in the room. I guess she's an Avatar fan, but yeah, she, it was huge. And actually the same team uh, as behind um, the show that I'm currently doing on Netflix now, The Dragon Prince. So... Um, Right now, I'm, I'm voicing Arkin and voicing Erebus on the uh, Dragon Prince, so uh, which is great. I get to I get to kind of bury this baritone with both characters. Uh, Arkin is actually a little bit lower in my register than than uh, Erebus, but having having a great time. I know you touched on earlier on that that you actually started out um, in your early days doing some disc jockeying and stuff. Did you actually want to go? into doing any kind of radio work or, or stick to the voice acting. I know that um, with, with your character Three Dog that, um, that that's more around a, a radio kind of broadcasting voice. Did, did that kind of... Uh, well, you know, I, I've, I've always wanted to act. I just, I never realized just how much I actually enjoyed being a DJ. To be perfectly honest, I would love to be a DJ now and it's because I get such comfort um, spinning records, more so than being a talk DJ. I love spinning records, and I started off being like a jazz DJ and then then R and B DJ. So you know, it's fun that that Three Dog is you know this post apocalyptic DJ who plays the American Songbook. I love I love that, and yeah. I, so I'm actually a, you know I, I'm actually a huge American Songbook. Fan, so you know, occasionally I'll actually even you know put together a, a a list of songs and and play them and put provide YouTube links and send them around on Twitter. Yeah, so in that three dog vein, but um, no, I always wanted to always wanted to act, um, and uh, you know, thankfully the voiceover realm has given me an opportunity to actually uh, uh, do kind of put the pieces together of all of all of my of all of my loves acting and uh, playing around with my voice as well so it's, it's, it's given a you a chance to find your own kind of niche your own market it's given you a chance to figure out you know where where you actually feel comfortable in that industry as well people forget that you know you're going to get people who were made for streaming you're going to get people who were made for radio and talk shows you're going to get people who would be more suited to the small screen or even the big screen and, and you've just got to find your own niche market there haven't you it's true and what's what's interesting oh, yeah. is that um my physical size i'm actually six feet six inches tall so i'm actually quite a deal taller than the average actor so my physical size and my vocal registry being a baritone has really you know in terms of the visual medium I'm always a villain. Yeah. And what's interesting is, is you know, suddenly I wind up uh, doing villainous work in, in, in the voiceover realm as well. So I guess, you know, it's less me trying to find my niche than my niche has kind of found me. And um, uh, even in voiceovers, they, you know, uh, I mean, it's very interesting to wind up doing primarily voice work in the science realm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's for some reason my baritone seems to inspire wonder, so they have me doing a lot of space stuff. So, anyway, that's that. That's a, you know, you just kind of you kind of go go where you can actually have an opportunity and 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 share whatever gift that you have. Absolutely. I mean, I, I know that you touched on being the bad guy there. I know it's the. In a, in a lot of your roles, actually, um, especially the, the spoken bits, the, the voice acting side of it all, there's, there's some similarities um, between, between quite a lot of them. When you look at um, Call the Face Dealer, Luther Mahoney, no, uh, Neza, uh, Prince Arkan, in the, the role ruthless, murderous, and near psychopathic roles. Um, <laughs> have you... Um, That's a hell of a lot more fun to play than the other way around, trust yeah. me. Yeah, well, I always, I always say Darkseid has cookies, and that's that's pretty accurate, to be honest. Um, have, have any of the roles that you've played inspired future characters that you've ended up doing um, in, in the portrayal, either on a physical or on a vocal um, element? 
Well, um, I guess in in little ways they kind of they 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 do inspire me. I I think Luther Mahoney probably has had a greater it's probably had the greatest it was probably the greatest inspiration because it was such a surprise to actually have I never thought in a million years someone would select me to play a drug lord <laughs> uh, but the beauty of that character was that I you know I got a chance to kind of do something that I like to do and that is to play a character who is unpredictable and actually is more dangerous because of the way he thinks than for anything he does or what have you. So the beautiful thing about Luther was it gave me an opportunity to kind of uh, be this nefarious character without actually having to really lift a finger. And that really has inspired me in terms of some of these other folks. So I actually find ways to play around with humor and ways to play, you know, try to, to try to find different ways to make a character uh, interesting. The, the, the actors that have really, and the actors that really inspired me uh, coming up, uh, you know, Anthony Hopkins and Christopher Walken and um, Morgan Freeman, and many of these actors uh, do many surprising, interesting things. I learned a great deal watching Anthony Hopkins and Silence of the Lambs and just kind of finding the you know people like Christopher Walken who really play around with their vocal register. I mean, they really do. They do very odd, different kinds of things, and so that's really kind of been the way that my career sort of unfolded. And I think some of some of these characters um, are not nearly as straightforward as 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 um, uh, I play them. Not nearly as straightforward as they are written. I mean, I think Arkin is kind of <laughs> is probably the most straight laced, uh, you know. It's straight defined character I've probably ever played, and so what's interesting to me is to have this kind of redemption and this romantic twist is something that is very surprising and interesting to play. I know it's the that with um, with quite a lot of your roles, there's a lot of similarity uh, in in the vocal elements as well like when you look at Code the face dealer and then you look at Prince Arkham there's a lot of lines that that the, the voice is quite identical is that something that's intentional on your part or was that something that the studios wanted you to bring to the table no I, I, I it's it's more intentional it's actually many times it's more in terms of the way things are written I mean Co was very interesting I had no clue where I was gonna go with that but once I actually had the lines in front of me that was really, for me, there was really only one way to play that character because there's something seductive and very, actually kind of terrifying in, 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 uh, in the character. Um, when, I, when I got the role of Arkin, what's interesting is, and this is the, the toughest thing about many of these voice jobs is that you actually, many of these jobs, you have no idea what the character is how the character is defined. Occasionally they will tell you, uh, uh, you know, what the particular uh, show is that you're going to be working on, but many times they don't even do that. They may actually only give you, uh, they may actually only say that this character is a prince. Yeah. And so you're literally only bringing that to the table. And so, you know, I will try many different things and, you know, I leave it up to, to they generally, it's the producers that will decide, you know, so we want to go with this particular vocal range or this particular look. And I just actually go from there and I create from there. I mean, it's kind of an ass backwards way of creating a character, something very different than I would do with a visual character yeah. uh, as I build that role. So, you know, I, I'm literally, I'm literally truly, truly dependent on, on A, the writing and truly depending on, on, um, what the producers have had have in their minds early on. Um, so it's a, a, you know, any similarities between Co and Arkin are really because the producers just decided, you know, so like I want that I want that character to to have that range of voice. And so I said, okay, well there we go. Um, I mean, oddly enough, it had been probably a year and a half in between the time the last time that I recorded Arkin. To when I recorded him, and since then, I had been I had grown so accustomed to playing 
this character Erebos on the Dragon Prince. So much humor, so many different kinds of things. And the last time I played Arkin was when he, he had kind of developed this romantic side. And, you know, and what was interesting, I didn't realize how deep in, uh, in my register the Arkin character was. I had to have someone play it back. And I said, wow, I voiced him that deep? Um, and so, um, you know, so, I mean, it's kind of fun to kind of bleep back into that. Um, so, anyway, a lot, a lot of the similarities because, you know, in very real terms, it's very difficult to um, do something that um, is not right in the center of your, of your own particular acting wheelhouse because so many producers, I guess maybe because there's so much money on the line or what have you, they really don't want to take those kinds of risks. Yeah. So as opposed to you kind of coming to the table and exploding. I mean, I really lucked out with Three Dog because I literally created 10 characters and that was my audition. They gave, just gave me, you know, like this, someone would say, you know, uh, waiter. And what do you come up with? So I had like 10 different, uh, uh, dis, uh, 10 different uh, job descriptions. And one of them was disc jockey. And I literally, you know, I was always in love with, I've been in love with Wolfman Jack since I was a kid, since I saw, uh, you know, American Graffiti. So when I saw Disc Jockey, I did not want to do, well, you know, I, I could do, you know, classic soul DJ. I just decided, well, I'm going to play around like Wolfman Jack and just have fun. So I did all of these things, and this is really my homage to Wolfman Jack, and I was just, you know, growling and hooting, drawing these kind of things. And so of all ten of the things that I that I sent them to, to them, they said, we want you to do the, the DJ voice. And then I came in one day and literally... Uh, worked or practically around the clock, just line after line after line, having no clue what project I was working on, just having the time of my life. And if you if you want to know an odd feeling, imagine walking into a booth and someone feeding you lines out of Fallout, and you have no idea where they're coming from. And I'm talking, you know, I'm talking about, you know, uh, 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 Nuka Colas and and all sorts of beasts and whole. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. All I know is it was so much fun because, you know, because I I literally could just ad lib and play. They used a lot of my own personal character development. Um, And, you know, then one day someone, you know, I was taking a swim class and the coach had mentioned this three dog. I said, well, I played a character named three dog. They said, you played a character named three dog? Yeah. And. What and he showed me that it was Fallout Three, and I said I played that. And this guy literally, you would have thought that I was, you know, you know, a teen sex symbol. He nearly fainted when he realized I was the guy playing this role. So I had no clue how huge Fallout was. Yeah. Have you nope. have you found that that you've got a lot more creative freedoms as a voice actor compared to when you're on set? Uh, I mean, for me, actually, they're really the same. I I have always been sort of a fringe actor. And so I, and I come from an improvisational background. So, so much of the stuff that I do, no matter what I do, I'm playing around. And I, I don't get many jobs, but generally the jobs that I get are referrals because they come from directors that like the fact that I'm going to improvise and bring something that's new and strange. So, I mean, it's, for me, it's been pretty much it's been pretty much the same. I mean, I I uh, uh, I probably have had more free probably had more freedom in live action than I've had thus far in because I'm still really a guy kind of I feel like I'm still starting out in terms of in terms of the voice the voiceover uh, in terms of voice work. I mean, so many of these actors, I guess. Probably since so many of them are in Los Angeles or what have you, they have these they have huge, varied careers. I'm actually very fortunate. I play a few characters, and oddly enough, they're characters in, in, that are in projects that are beloved. So I mean, that's that that's just a great surprise, and um, it, it's just great luck on my part. How do you find you handle that though? Because it, like, a lot of the recording studios tend to be across either California or in uh, in Texas, for example, and you're based over in in Washington D.C. 
Yeah, and it's been very difficult, but thankfully, someone like Aaron Ehas, um, uh, um, you know, who's doing the Dragon Prince, I'm the only actor that does not record that show in Vancouver. And so it just kind of, it's been a trust issue, and it's because I did Co. And, you know, they were in Los Angeles, and I was in Washington, D.C., and they loved that. So they actually gave me that opportunity. Many of these folks just do, simply do not give you that opportunity. Um, perhaps during this pandemic, um, they're giving more actors these op- a- actors who are, uh, ooh, ooh, God, my dog is going bananas. More actors that are in different locations are getting opportunities. But, you know, that's because we're in this unprecedented time and so many people need to have home studios and people can't get to these Los Angeles studios. So they're getting, you know, getting more opportunities. But it's been very difficult for me, to be perfectly honest. Do you find that you've had many disagreements with the studios regarding either the, the persona or the, the voice style of certain characters that you've covered over the years? No, no. I, I actually, everyone's actually been really, really supportive. I think the only controversial moment I ever had was apparently I really got on the wrong side of Todd Howard, the, the, the Fallout um, founder um, or creator, um, because I tweeted that it looks like Three Dogs is going to be back. And the only reason why I tweeted that and I had just literally just gotten on Twitter was because the casting director told me that exact quote looks like three dogs going to be back. And I had no idea that that was antithetical to any kind of non-disclosure agreements or whatever. I mean, I reported three dogs nearly a decade ago, so I had no idea. But um, by the time they got to fall to Fallout uh, 76 or what have you, um, uh, three dog wasn't, wasn't a part of the, of the next Fallout. So that was a great disappointment. Um, and, um, so I don't know. That's the only controversy I've ever, ever, ever been in. Now, how, how do you feel about that? Do you feel as though it's, it's one of them situations where you can sit down and negotiate something with them? Or is it one of them where you, you know, if, if there's that much, um, dirty water under the bridge kind of thing that you're prepared to walk away from that role? Well, my hope is that it's water under the bridge. I have, I have no clue what's frustrating is that I was cast in that out of Washington, D.C., and then by the time Fallout 3 came out, they moved all of the casting to Los Angeles, and so I have, like, zero relationship with the people that are casting out there. We've never, you know, I've never come through those studios, never had lunch with these folks, never done any of the stuff that all the schmoozing that you need to do in all those places to let people know who you are, so... My, my reputation has to speak for itself. And, you know, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I, uh, you, would get a, you would have a fine argument if you were to say that Three Dog was the most famous character out of that entire Fallout series. You would, you, uh, he arguably is. I mean, next to the, the guy in Vault 1. So, um, you know, on some level, I don't particularly understand why I have not been at least auditioned for other particular roles. I mean, Nazir, I mean, they seemed to love me in D.C. back in the day, but I don't know what's going on with that. Hopefully it's water on the bridge. If it's not, I, you know, I, I, you know I, I certainly moved on. Um, if something happens, fantastic. I'm not going to burn that bridge. But right now I've got four more seasons of The Dragon Prince to do. I have no idea what else is coming from from Arkin, but I do know that there is some Arkin coming and even a little Thexan coming because I reported it and I was very excited about it. So whenever oh, there this... we go, guys, we've got some, some sneaky little spoilers there that Eric's been working on some Arkin and Thexan. Yeah, and so that that that's actually very exciting. Um, I, I I love getting in, in there and doing that. I mean, you know, I got to tell you something that's, that's funny. You talk about people say finding Easter eggs. Um, if you actually listen, I actually play, um, they actually recorded me doing four different characters in the Star Wars game. 
So I'm uncredited as three different characters. And I will say this to all the fans that I use a totally different register in my voice for all three of these other characters. Are you able to give us any kind of clue on, on who those three <laughs> characters are? No, I mean, I don't even know their names. I mean, they, I, you know, there are little, 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 uh, uh, scenes that go on, my like shopkeep scenes or, or what have you. I think I'm a mechanic in one. And I mean, it's very funny, but, you know, I mean, one of the characters voices is way up here. And so I had everybody howling when I came with that voice. So, um, you know, so it's not only doing Arkin and Texans, you know, I, I, I always tell them, I say, well, look, you guys got any other small, small parts? Let me play with them. But oddly enough, my voice could actually do it. I can actually do a heck of a lot more with my voice than, than I've been given an opportunity to do. So when you were when you were recording the the voice work for Knights of the Fallen Empire, Knights of the Eternal Throne, and for uh, Onslaught, did you do all of that recording from your own home studio, or did you? Uh, well, I mean, have literally, to fly over? literally, um, League of Legends. Um, uh, I must admit, they treated me literally like a king. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I felt like Morgan Freeman for that. They would not tell me what I was doing. They, this organization, this group actually sent me a first class ticket to Los Angeles, put me up in a hotel, and it wasn't until I was driven to the studio that someone told me, uh, oh, by the way, you're going to be in a show called League of Legends. And it is literally, and I was like, huh? I had no clue what that was. And I came to the studio, and once again, I ran into my friend Aaron, who had cast me as Co. And he's the reason why I played played Nasus in that show. And they said, well, there they was an original Nasus, and it's no longer. And, you know, so I got a chance to listen to that and then just play over the course of two days. It was, it was really, really extraordinary. And with regards to League of Legends, I will say that I actually just got a chance to record Nasus for the first time in... A zillion years. I just did that probably four weeks ago. So I'm very excited about that as well. Wow. So even even during lockdown, you, you're able to keep yourself busy with work constantly at the moment. Yeah, it was fun. I did, and I did a Dungeons and Dragons inspired. There's a Dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons inspired board game that's connected to the Dragon Prince, and so I got a chance to go into the studio to record uh, the commercial for that. Um, and so that was that was terrific. So I must admit, I had like a, a three week period where I, I was a, an in demand voice actor, and it was truly, truly, truly exciting. But I did all of that work at a studio. I did none of it at home. I did all of it at a studio. Uh, it was kind of a surreal experience because the studios are normally you know bopping with with energy and people. But this was a whole bunch of closed doors, and I literally only saw uh, two people. Um, you know, they kind of walked me back with my mask on. I took my mask on, sipped some water, and did my thing, and then they escorted me out, and that was that. Wow. <laughs> so, That's completely different to how you would have done things two or three years ago, definitely. Uh, it's, it's truly, truly depressing. I, I did my first uh, 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 San Diego Comic Con. We did did a a Zoom uh, gathering of the cast of the Dragon Prince, and that was a blast. Um, I cannot wait to actually go to San Diego and do a live Comic Con. Uh, hopefully, that will occur next year. Hopefully, we'll be we'll all have our vaccines, and that and that'll happen. But I would love to do that. Um, and I actually missed out on the Star Wars gathering in London. I actually had did have an opportunity, but my mom actually had surgery, so I couldn't get out there. And that would have been really magical because that brought together everybody from the Star Wars universe. I was actually going to ask you about that as a follow-up when you mentioned about the the Comic Con stuff there. I was going to ask whether you whether you're going to consider doing any of the UK or European uh, circuits in the future. Well, I I I, I really I, I hope to do it, and I. I mean, I would have loved to have gone to London when they when they had you know all of the big Hollywood actors and whole nine yards because they had um, the old Republic voice actors there, but I, I couldn't make it out there for that. That would have been really exciting. 
what's your relationship generally been like with um, with Darren DePaul and, and Natasha Loring when it when it comes to the recording side of things? Do you tend to kind of play off of each other a little bit more and express your characters yeah. that way? No, all of it is all everything that I've done. I don't even listen to their roles. I just have, they have me in there just doing the lines. And like Darren, what's funny is we befriended each other just on social media. We have never met. Um, and then you know, I kind of go back and listen to his work and all the kind of fun stuff. So I mean, it's bizarre. It's it, it, the the whole thing is very strange. Have you, have you um, found that you've been able to? build on those relationships with the people that you've worked with? Do you keep in touch with quite quite a lot of the people that you've, you've worked with over the... Oh, well, over the every, now and again, every now and again. And, you know, since I've been working on this Dragon Prince, I've, I've, I think this is probably the most social of the groups. Um, and so that's been fun. But actually, that our Zoom gathering was the first time we've, I've actually uh, seen everybody, you know, seeing their lips moving i mean you know aside from from you know communications on twitter I, it, it was the first time i actually saw a live people they're actually very lucky that you know, they're all you know they get together in vancouver and record those things standing side by side and what have you i am literally uh, you know I, I have the the writers and producers on skype giving me direction and i'm doing my thing um you know, I, I don't even hear the lines beforehand. I'm just, you know, <laughs> just do what they say. We'll do X, Y, and Z. And, I, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised at how they pieced all this stuff together. So it looks like we're actually having a real conversation. It's been really extraordinary. Now, for you as um, an established voice actor, do you actually get time to actually sit down and, and play video games at all? I mean, are you the kind of person who can actually handle okay. watching their own work? I am, I, am the, I am the worst. I mean, first of all, it would be great if I was, you know, if I started doing all this stuff when I was, you know, 17 years old. Instead, I have, I'm totally clueless. My mom, for one Christmas, bought me an Xbox. I had no clue what the hell you play on an Xbox. <laughs> and, you know, I have autographed copies of, 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 uh, my Fallout games would have but I ne never had a chance to play them. But I did get um, uh, a few video games, and I'm absolutely awful at them. I mean, I literally, yeah, I mean, the average person would laugh if they saw me. I and mean, I could literally spend an hour, and, you know, I'm still trying to, 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 to follow the person that was in front of me. I must, you know, these games must start over every five seconds because I'm like, oh my God, I lost this person again. Or I can't get out of this castle. Or I'm, you know, this character's walking in the walls. I, you know, then my nieces will come over and they'll grab these things and they'll, they could go through the whole game in a, in a couple hours. They just don't, da, 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 da. oh yeah, I'm on level, whatever. And I'm like, huh? So, you know, I used to exaggerate and tell people that, you know, how much I loved uh, a certain game if I was a part of it. But now I just tell people I'm lousy at it. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm an actor. Maybe, maybe one day I'll learn how to really play these things. Um, have you found that actually doing some of the voice work or some of the, the TV stuff that you've done, have you found that it's had an impact on your own mental health and how you've actually kind of approached different scenarios and different situations in life? Hmm. I think as far as being an actor and dealing with mental, mental health, the only thing I can really say is that each time I've had an opportunity to play one of these characters, since I'm actually doing something that I love, they're actually helping me in terms of, you know, e emotionally. I do know that um, it's allowed me to approach things in a different way because I actually find it impossible to dis... You can't really dislike anyone that you're actually playing. I mean, unless an internal dislike is a part of the process emotional process of the character. And so what I find interesting is there are a lot of people I would, a lot of characters I play that I would never want to come into contact with, but when I actually slip into their skin, many of them are really 
and they're really exciting to play because they actually are doing things that I would never do, and they're saying things I would never say, and um, and you know, many times they have far much more confidence than I have. You know, I just you can build a great deal, many fantasy lives about some of these folks. So anyway, that. You know that's probably a, 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 as as close to anything emotional that I've actually gotten from the characters. And it's, you know, just sort of unlocking certain freedoms. Yeah. I will tell you this: that I I played a transsexual character on the TV series NYPD Blue, and you know that was probably the toughest character I ever had to play emotionally because I literally had to be in a situation where I had to play someone that at some point or other was so unhappy in their own bodies that they wanted that the only way that they could actually be liberated was to go through some extraordinary, extraordinarily drastic and dangerous measures. And so that character was really an, an emotional and complex character to play. And shedding that character's skin was actually very difficult because, you know, I, 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 you really end up falling in love with with the character because the character's in so much pain. I mean, when you think about it as well, when, when you actually did that, that was, what, 20 years ago? Yeah. I mean, it's a character now that, I mean, I literally, I've even said this on Twitter that I probably would never even get a chance to play it. I mean, I, they, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I, I I cannot see many actors that could have played that role better. But I'd probably be canceled by all these young people now. <laughs> I mean, well, we are they, in that cancel culture nowadays, aren't we? Oh, I mean, they they literally, and you know, it has less to do with acting than it does to do with actually real representation. And so, I mean, I think personally, I find that to be, you know ridiculous uh you know in terms of what acting the profession is actually about um i can understand people being emotional but it makes absolutely no sense i don't think a lived-in experience is not going to guarantee anything in a performance i mean anything um uh you know you have you have got to be able to to tap into to ele to certain certain things and those kinds of things are, are those are gifts that are just given to you. Have nothing to do with you know. I don't wake up as uh, you know as a as a black man being able to play everything that has to do with black people. I just don't. I only have my own experience. And in order for me to find certain experiences, I have to do a lot of research, and I have to, and I have to rely on ability. So it's it's you know. So I find that to be really odd. Oh, this person this person is not trans. They can't play a trans character. I'm like, oh, so of course they can. I mean, you know, I and mean, you can probably play it very well. I mean, you're in England, and you know, and you are no Tracy Ullman. I have watched Tracy Ullman play roles seamlessly. I, I mean, seamlessly because that's her facility. Daniel J. Lewis has that facility. Meryl Streep has that facility, and there's some people that have that facility. They can, they can do that, and that is a gift. And I, I, I think we're really hurting the craft of acting by, by dwelling on representation, dwelling on diversity. I think it's utterly ridiculous. Yeah. Personally. I know that for, for people in the States who start going into acting and even just doing TV stuff that, like you said, they started off on the Tracy Ullman show and Mickey Ma uh, you know, Mickey's house and that sort of stuff. And that's how generally you get into the circuit. I know that's how people like Nancy Cartwright started off with working on The Simpsons because that's how she started off with the Tracy Ullman show. But you yeah. you started in a, in a little bit of a different path because you actually did did a few a few small movies with uh, Spike Lee. Yeah, I mean, and that uh, what what was interesting there is that. I had actually done a film prior to She's Gotta Have It. Um, and I worked with um, Fred Breitwhite, who, who um, in the hip hop world was known as Fab Five Freddy. We worked together, and he was actually a friend of Spike's from the New York, Brooklyn days and the whole nine yards. And I went to go visit Freddy in New York, and he said, Well, I'm actually working 
my friend Spike it, it just got out of NYU's graduate school and he's doing a a film and he and wants me to say a line in his film and then we'll go grab some lunch. I said, cool. So I went with him and he was doing She's Gotta Have It and Spike and I met. I had no idea who he was. And he said, why don't you say a line for me? I said a line for him. I go back to school. I was going to Brown University, and a, a professor of mine had gone to the Cannes Film Festival and said, oh, my God, I saw you in a film at Cannes. I'm thinking it's the film that I did with Freddie, which was was a, a pretty bad movie. And I was sitting there going, like, I was at Cannes? Wow. And he said, you said this line. I was like, that line? I said that for some some school kid kind of thing. Had no idea. Um Long story short, Spike ends up, you know, becoming a phenomenon and puts me in his second film. Um, very depressing because I was, a, I'm a huge fan of Spike's and I have not worked with him since. Auditioned for him a zillion times before, uh, after that, and have not worked with him since. And, you know, now, of course, he can work with everybody, everybody and their, and, and their uncle, as they say. But, uh, yeah, I had a, it was a, it was a, a terrific moment. And so doing that was interesting. I started off, I was in comedy, and then I had actually left. I'd gone to Los Angeles, nothing happened. I left the acting world for a few years before um, a dear friend of mine directed an episode of Homicide, and my mom convinced me to actually go read for him. I went to go read for like a character that had a couple lines, and as I was leaving, they asked me to read for Luther Mahoney, and I, I literally read it, read it as a lark, because I was thinking there's not Snowball's chance in hell I'd play a drug lord, and I'd say, no, we're doing that character. So, you know, odd things have, have occurred. Yeah, Most it's, of it's very and, weird when you look at uh, some actors and, and the, the kind of roles that they've portrayed over the years, and you... you You'd yeah. look at some of their earlier work prior to that movie or prior to that TV show, and you'd think, do you know what? That just doesn't seem like that person. It, they just don't have that kind of persona. Yeah. It's totally different. I mean, you look at what happened with Keith Sutherland after he, he went and did Jack Bauer, and then he's gone to a more caring and candid kind of role, and it's just something that you wouldn't expect. You'd expect him to be yelling at somebody and trying to torture and coerce them, and it's just not... It's not expected when when they've had that kind of role. It's so true. You never know where it's where it's going. I mean, I used to always get surprised here in the states. Um, you know, where so many great actors would start off doing you know silly romantic stuff on a soap opera, and next thing you know, they're you know they're the Bradley Coopers of the world. I mean, they're up for Oscars, and you're like, huh? Well, that was the guy that was the love interest, you know. Uh, and so and that used to be the place to cut your teeth. If you weren't on a Broadway stage, then you were doing a New York soap. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I'm just excited that I actually have an opportunity to, to do a little bit of something. It's not a great deal of something, but it's, um, it's nice to be able to do something that's creative and something that keeps, keeps me still in the, uh, in the mix. I'm really excited that Fallout now is going, apparently is going to be a TV series. And so they've got, you know, big names behind HBO's uh, Westworld are developing that. And that um, I would love, 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 love to have an opportunity to, to do Three Dog as a live character. I mean, so much of Three Dog is really just voice because on, on the air, but I am really hoping that Fallout 3, that they're big fans of that one, because I would love to be a part of that. Absolutely. How did your um, how did your family take to you with the voice acting and going into TV stuff? Because I know like your late father, Ron, um, had, had spent a, a large chunk of his life, if not the majority of it, in politics, and he was the mayor of Oakland, he was a presidential nominee at one point, and your mum was a lawyer, if I remember rightly, so like, how did they take to you going into a studio and doing voice work, were they supportive of that? Uh, well, oh, definitely on the... Um, um, uh, in terms of my voiceover work, because, you know, I, I would also do locally some voice of God work, and so I had an opportunity to, you know, to to uh, be the voice behind, the, you know, the opening of the Martin Luther King 
uh, memorial and doing certain things like that. So I actually w- was doing some actually some some pretty serious stuff here in Washington, which was which was fun. And then of course that led to other uh, documentary stuff. So they've been were very supportive. My father has since passed, but very supportive of, of that. And um, you know, and my mom, my mom of course loves in, anything I do that has to do with acting. I mean, she's just a, she is, uh, has always been a champion of that. So she would she would like for me to get more roles. You know, you know, uh, uh, acting. She had a has had a ball showing my nieces the Dragon Prince and stuff, and she would like for me to you know. Uh, She'd have a ball if I had it was on a show like Family Guy or something like that. I mean, you know, if I, if I finally have a character that you know comes on once a week, she'll she she would love every moment of that as as would I. I know you touched earlier on about that you um, have recently done some stuff not just relating to Arkan but also relating to Thexon. Uh, yeah, that was actually a surprise to me. Right, right before we left, they asked me, "I would like you to do this." I would, I wish they would do more Thexan. I mean, I actually, I did some Thexan early on, um, and you know, and he has a variation of of Arkin's voice, but there's enough subtle difference in there. I mean, you know, twins obviously would have some similarities. Um, but I wish we had more to do. I, I think I only had maybe one or two lines to actually do whatever this new thing is that they're doing. So that 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 it was disappointing that it wasn't that it wasn't more. But I I, I, I certainly wish that they would develop that character more. When I mean when when you look at, um, at Arkan, Thexon, and uh, Valen as a as a trio of siblings. Sure. All, all three of them are, are ruthless and vindictive, and there's there's so much hatred between the three of them uh, sure. that's, that's expressed. Do you do you think looking back at, at Thexon as a character prior to his demise that maybe there would have been a degree of um, of him forgiving Arkham for what he did, and maybe there would have been a bit of remorse um, from Arkham in regards to you know not being able to even save save Valen from a tragic demise. Do you think that that would have been the case? I know that Arkham's redemption story is, is quite intimate and quite deep. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I, I I think that would have been an interesting role for for effects in the play. I mean, what's interesting is I am one of three kids, and I know that you know the social dynamics can be can be great but there's within that mix there's always the one that winds up kind of being the keeper of the peace that actually was at my role in this family but i think that would have been very interesting for 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 sex and um uh I, I i would have loved for them to have had that opportunity of course you know trying to be a peacemaker when you're dealing with people that are ruthless, um, you know, it <laughs> could have led to an even earlier demise, for all we know. Do you have any um, any interesting kind of stories to share from being on set, whether it's on the TV shows or whether it's from maybe doing some of the vocal stuff for Swator or for League of Legends or for Fallout? Um, I unfortunately don't have any very little to share with regards to voice work because so much of that has been so isolated. Um, um, you know, I, one of the things that I that I loved um, that I, I used to love about being on a set was the camaraderie. I mean, every single set was really its own little family. Um, what was fun was it was fun being the villain on Homicide. I would literally walk on the set and there were literally production people that would boo and hiss. And it just became like this this great joke. Like, you know, here he comes. I started to tell them that I started to feel like the, you know, like the Batman villain. Um, it was so much fun to, 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 uh, to, to do that. Um, um, I mean, it's... I really wish I had more. I mean, I love working with Aaron and with 
Justin on the Dragon Prince because we, you know, have uh, such fun, but we're never in the same room, yeah. or rarely in the same room. They did come out, Aaron did come out one time we were doing one of uh, Nasus's pieces, and I was actually in Los Angeles for that other piece, so that was actually a lot of fun. Um, so, I mean, I wish I had had more stories. Generally, I'm a guy standing in a booth with a bottle of water, uh, <laughs> staring, staring at a screen, and generally the screen that I'm staring at is of the of the director writers, not the screen from the show. Um, I tell you, the most magical thing was I got to tell you is when they played Freddie's music, his theme for for fall for um, Dragon Prince, and they would play that, and then I knew that you know something. This series is going to open, and it's going to open with Freddie's music and my voice. That's the first thing that you hear um, in the show, and I was so honored to be this really this storyteller and to have the music there was so made it so glorious he just it made me i it made me want to to it inspired my 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 reading so much more and so that that was great i mean to actually be a storyteller before there was even actually even a character was was really a tremendous um do you have any kind of any particular characters that you've you've done already that are maybe favourites uh, so up, up, up until press, or do you find that you love them all as equally, or you know, is there any well, that you don't like I as think, much? I mean, I think right now the one that I I favour is the one that I know that I'm going to have work to do, <laughs> <laughs> and that's. And that's Erebus on the Dragon Prince. He becomes my favorite because I know I can anticipate that there's more there. I don't know what else is there at all. I know, um, I know you said earlier on that there's going to be about, what, another four seasons? Yeah, that's going to be very exciting. And I do know that, that this particular character uh, is a meaningful, will be a meaningful part of this. So I'm, I'm actually really excited. Animation takes so long. That's yeah. the only problem, is that you have so much writing, and then you know, and then you do your acting, and then you've still got to wait for them to do whatever it is. Um, so, um, that, I mean, that's the tough part. I real, I really do. I I long to do more more video game characters. I really do. Um, unfortunately, that Los Angeles is that. I mean, they own that right now in terms of all the major companies they own it and the actors that are there own that and it's very difficult to find anything outside of you know kind of like a non-union kind of uh shoot i gotta tell you this though i get really really pissed when i don't get these roles and that's really uh, unnerving to me um you know i have literally i've auditioned for a few of these video games that are out, and I get really pissed when I don't get cast in them. I'm just, you know, part of me is like, huh, I'm going to go watch this and see who the heck can play this dog on thing. So, anyway, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. I know you said earlier on that when it comes to going into the studio, doing your, doing your lines, that they, they give you very little when it comes to actually knowing what kind of character you're going to be doing. Like, when... Charles and Eric may have, you know, when they came to you when um, when you started with Prince Ark and all they basically said to you was, you're voicing a prince. But did they actually did they actually show you what he would actually look like? Do you find that you get a bit of inspiration from actually knowing I actually what a character looks like? I didn't see Ark until actually we'd actually recorded. And when I saw him, I mean, I was so blown away because I saw that trailer. That trailer was just stunning. Um, I mean, really, just they did such a masterful job on that trailer. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the the cool part is that you know there's so much folklore. You don't really have enough time to kind of uh, um, digest all of it because you're getting it all at once. They will kind of tell you that this background is it is. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about you know. You have to be able to pronounce Zaku. You have to, 
all these things that are going in there, and you just don't have a lot of time to digest exactly where something's coming from. So you have to kind of, they kind of break things down almost in, you know, you know, Shakespeare for dummies terms, where you kind of, you know what the motivations are, you know this is going to be greed, this is going to be whatever it is, we've got to, you got to strip away all that stuff so you can get down to kind of like this bare essence of, 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 of what these characters are that you're playing. Um, and it's really not, it, it really wasn't until I actually saw the trailers that I actually got a chance to really see, oh, okay, well, I could see where these characters could actually go. Did, um, did you guys get a chance to actually see the trailers before they were released to the general public, or was it just a case no, of I, when it drops, it drops? I, I, I saw it along with everybody else. Wow. And I was just blown away. I was like, whoa, oh, this is great. And, uh, I mean, you know, I had no idea what happened to Arkin's face. I had not, I, I learned all of that from watching the trailer. But once you'd done the vocals that first time and then you'd seen the trailer, did you change how you recorded Arkin in the future after that, the first time? Well, no, I mean, actually, it just, it just made, it made subsequent readings that much stronger because all of a sudden I literally had it's like you know I, I suddenly had a memory and so and so that that made it far easier and I'm drawing on a memory and it's literally a visual a visual mem it's just a, it's just a memory of the trailer that I saw I suddenly knew how he was moving I knew whatever it is and that. I mean I'll be perfectly honest once I actually saw the trailer I actually thought, oh, I made the voice actually too deep. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I said, I, just, I could have gone for a more youthful thing, but, you know, I had already committed to it beforehand. Um, and um, so, uh, but, you know, you just do what you got to do. There's, there's nothing you can do after that. Do you find it a bit harder actually doing the voices from, from your home studio compared to actually flying in? Because you're kind of having to wing it just by recording them and then sending them over for them to, to kind of check out, don't you? I suppose you well, kind of close the process out. Well, I'm only actually working on my home studio if I have to do an audition. Other than that, I mean, I'll go into, into a professional studio. I mean, I like, I prefer dealing, having a sound engineer there and having the voice of the director there or the or the director on Skype. Um, I prefer, you know, I do, I, I actually work better in a director's hands uh, than I do on my own. So I just try to ensure that, that, you know, that, you know, I have something within me personally that, that aims to please. And so it's very important. It, it's it very important to me to hear someone say, I like that or, you know, to, to, to say that they're satisfied because, you know, I have, I, I, I'm absolutely clueless and I'll just, you know, I'll do something a zillion times because I, you know, I cannot, uh, I cannot grade myself or see, see, I have to hear from someone else that I'm actually given and what it is that they, that they had in mind. Yeah. And then, you know, I, then I get more and more inspired, like, you know, when, you know, when, when I know that, that um, I have some kind of approbation there that someone is actually pleased with something that I'm doing. I know, we, I, I know we have to be kind of careful with, with some of the reveals and stuff because of NDAs, uh, the, the no disclosure agreements and stuff, but the, the lines that you've recently done for Arkan and uh, Thexon, is that the only work that Bioware have actually lined up for you so far relating to these characters, or have they given you any kind of indication? You know, like with um, with, with the series that you're doing at the moment on Netflix, they've said, look, Eric, you've got four seasons worth of work here, but have Bioware done anything similar? Have they said, look, we want you no. to come back in six uh, months and no, 12 months, or? No, they haven't. I literally, I only, um, the only thing I can say is that uh, they said uh, that I will be hearing from them more sooner than later. And so I take that to mean that um, there's, there'll be something else in the hopper. That, you know, I won't have to sit around for a year wondering what, the, twiddling my thumbs, wondering if Arkin's coming back. I think they're actually, so obviously they must be writing something now. So that, that's very exciting. Absolutely. Uh, 
I, but but no, they have not committed to anything beyond the words, oh, I can't wait, we'll, we'll, we've got something else coming. So, so I just keep my fingers crossed. I think maybe having this extra work there in terms of Fexen as well as with Arkan may actually be a good opportunity for you to maybe try the game out as well. It might give you a chance to actually explore the character as a complete package rather than just seeing it on a scene-by-scene -scene basis or in between recordings and stuff like that because you're only getting small snippets. Do you think maybe actually playing it through and looking at that character and what kind of responses you get and how it's interpreted, that might actually change or even amplify how you take that character forward? Well, it could, certainly. Uh, uh, it certainly could. Uh, uh, I should actually be a less lazy human being and should actually really uh, play the game like they keep telling me, Eric, get, sit down there and play this. Um, uh, but yeah, it would probably have... I mean, what's interesting to me is many times, I'm, I must admit, I will go on to YouTube or something, and when someone has uploaded something that they've done or whatever, so I, I do watch uh, bits and pieces of, way of, 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 of how things are actually unfolding. Um, so I, I, I kind of get it more that way than I do in, in, in any firsthand way by, from actually uh, uh, playing the character or what have you. So. But I hate to cut this short, but I actually, I actually do have to cut this short now. Uh, Mother Nature is actually calling me. <laughs> uh, but this has been such a great time. But you have to tell me something first. I want to know how did the name that duck sauce come about? <laughs> well, funnily enough, um, my, my nickname always growing up has always been Ducky. Um, ah! But my best friend used nothing to, to do with pretty and pink no 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 definitely not but okay my my best friend used to also um used to just throw in there uh, oh they call him that duck sauce and it just seemed to kind of <laughs> it just seemed to kind of stick it's it's really weird how it how it kind of stuck and i just thought i yeah, love it hell. i love it that's terrific I, uh, I've always, I've stuck with it since I've, I've known him 14 years and, and it's remarkable how it's never changed. Well, will you promise me when this new arc and stuff hits that we do this again? Definitely, definitely. I would really love to, uh, to get your response to that and, uh, you know, and then hopefully next go around maybe, uh, answer some questions from from your listeners absolutely yeah i know I've, I've managed to pull a couple of questions in from the chat along the way um so thank you very much for your time eric i will try and, and have a catch up with you at some point over the remainder of the weekend as well oh terrific um but thank you very much for your time um, oh you're more than welcome i'll let you get going my friend and i'll catch up with you over the weekend okay my friend thank you again thank you very very much Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, what the hell just happened, guys? What the hell? What the hell just happened? <laughs>